in search of our cosmic origins. Located high in the Andes mountain range, the 66 antennas that make up the Atacama Large Millimeter Submillimeter Array, ALMA, are an imposing sight. Under one sky, more than 20 countries embark upon a scientific endeavor that can only be realized through collaboration. North America, Europe, East Asia, and Chile work together to answer humankind's fundamental questions. Northern Chile was chosen as the site for ALMA because the Atacama Desert is the driest in the world. Its atmosphere, almost devoid of water vapor, enables detection of some of the faintest signals from the universe. Over 16,500 feet above sea level and covering distances of up to 10 miles of the Chachnantor Plateau, the ALMA antennas work as a single large telescope. A supercomputer combines and synchronizes all of their signals in real time. Thanks to this engineering and scientific feat, we're learning about the cold universe, the secrets of planet formation, and the chemical elements that constitute the building blocks of life. Professionals from around the world work for ALMA, pushing the limits of knowledge every day. In Chile, about 50 staff members are based in Santiago, while another 200 work in shifts at the operations support facility close to the town of San Pedro de Atacama. Most of the staff works in the offices, laboratories, and antenna control room of this facility at an altitude of 9,500 feet. Others ascend to the Chachnantor Plateau at 16,500 feet to maintain and relocate the antennas, among other tasks. Strict safety protocols are crucial under these conditions. Thanks to leisure and residential facilities, staff can lead a healthy lifestyle, playing sports and games, watching movies, enjoying nutritious meals, and resting in comfort. Alma plays a key role in global astronomical efforts. Along with other radio telescopes, it allowed the first image of a black hole to be captured. Without ALMA, that goal would have been unattainable. The Chilean astronomical community actively participates in ALMA research and discoveries using its 10% of observing time. The radio telescope also contributes to workforce development and supports national and regional scientific, technological, and outreach projects. An example of the latter are the thousands of visitors who tour the facilities each year. ALMA respects the local Liganantai or Atacameño indigenous culture, supporting educational and other projects in the town of Toconao and San Pedro de Atacama, preserving archaeological heritage sites, and protecting the unique flora and fauna of the region, to name a few initiatives. Mirroring the antennas that work in unison with one goal, under the same sky, the international collaboration that ALMA embodies continues the search of our cosmic origins. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Thais Mandiola. I'm a visitor coordinator at the observatory. Thank you very much for joining us today for our special virtual tour that we're doing for this instance about the control room in ALMA. Uh, we will have great guests today that will make us travel to ALMA through their knowledge. So it's gonna be a very special day. 
Uh, before beginning, it's important to clarify that at this moment and over a year now, there are no visits to the observatory due to the pandemic. Okay, so um, sadly, for now, we don't have any visitors to the observatory. Um, today, we have around 260 people working in ALMA, but really few know that 80% uh, of the staff are Chilean and that 65% of our staff work actually in ALMA facilities near to San Pedro de Atacama. About the, um, today's subject, astronomers and antenna operators that work in the control room, they don't really go up to the Chagnantor plateau that we saw in the video uh, and where the antennas are, but they work from the control room, as said. None of them really sees images that maybe you're waiting for, like the ones that we see from the discoveries, all these images. But well, really, our guests will tell us more about this and uh, what they actually see and monitor in the control room. Here, um, they have daily observations and they monitor according to the weather conditions. They have a screen and a dashboard where they can see the number of operating antennas of the 66 there are that Alma has. They have several stations for science. And well, all of this were actually will be connected with them, with the astronomers and operators from um, Santiago offices now. And as we're watching the videos, these are from the OSF at the facilities in San Pedro. So really, it's time to listen for our guest now. Today's guest will tell us more in detail about these stations and the work that they carry out in the control room. So we'll please welcome um, Sergio Martin and Ludwin Gonzo. Uh, how are you? How are you, Sergio and Ludwin? Hi, guys. How are you doing? Very good. Nice to see you guys. Yeah, well, you're actually now from the Santiago offices, no? You could tell us a little bit. You just started your shift now, no? Yeah, that's correct. Right now we are 1,200 kilometers away from the observatory, from the actual observatory. That's for the frame. I guess it's uh, more or less the distance between New York and Chicago or from yeah. Paris to Rome. We are really far away from the observatory but we're also able to operate the antenna from here. Uh, this control room here in Santiago was uh, a project that has been in development since several years ago, but it was pushed by the pandemics in order to keep us from going up to the, to the operations of our facility. Great, yeah. But well, first we go more in detail of what you're doing um, in the offices there in the control room. Um, if you could tell us a little bit of your journey to get to ALMA. Um, how, what did you study? Uh, where did you work before ALMA? Um, let's start with you, Ludwig. If you can tell us about your career path. <laughs> okay. So um, I'm an electronic engineer. I studied in Temuco. That's from where I come from, uh, in the University of La Frontera. And I started working at ALMA uh, several years ago. Well, as an array operator, I started six, uh, around six years ago. But I uh, before that, I worked in the construction of the European antennas, also as, a, as an antenna operator. Uh, and so, and, and, and well, uh, I, took, uh, I took a break from ALMA a few years after we finished the, the project of building the antennas. And then I came back as an array operator. So this is the more or less the background that helped me come here. So you saw the beginning and now fully operating. <laughs> what about you, Sergio? Tell us about your journey. Yeah, my journey started uh, a long time ago, more than two decades ago. Uh, I, I studied uh, physics my degree in physics in uh, in Madrid, in Spain, uh, with a specialization on, on, uh, on astronomy. And then from there, I moved to do my thesis 
so I, all my life I've been jumping from telescope to telescope. So I did my thesis on a, on a, on a telescope in the south of Spain, a radio telescope uh, in the south of Spain. Then I moved to, to Boston, where we were operating a, a telescope in Hawaii, uh, which was an interferometer similar to ALMA, but in, in the much, much smaller scale. And then I moved to ALMA here in the times where all the commissioning, were, when the first antennas were coming up, uh, working on the, on the assembly and the commissioning on the instrument. Then I went a couple of years to another telescope in the French Alps in, in France. And then finally I came back here like six years ago, just uh, working uh, as, a, as a staff for ALMA. Perfect. And what about the duties that you were doing there in the control room? What are you actually doing now? <laughs> okay, so well, well, at that. this very moment, we are not doing any scientific observation because mm -hmm. now engineering has taken over all the observatory in order to perform some maintenance and preventing works on the antennas. Uh, but usually we monitor the system, we monitor the antennas, all the subsystems. Uh, we, we start up also once uh, engineering finishes their works, they will hand the, the system over back to us and we have to start up, we have to prepare the system in order to start the scientific observations. And during that time, we, we keep monitoring the antennas. If something happens, then we have to we have to execute any corrective action in order to keep the system going as much time as possible. So in a nutshell, we keep the system going during the observations. Great. And in that case, to keep the system going, that you are connected with the maintenance group all the time, no? You have program for observation, for science, then the engineering group, then the computing group takes over. So if you can walk us through how is this program throughout the week and which times are you observing actually? Because people maybe don't know that you can observe during daytime, nighttime, you know, 24 seven. Can you speak a little bit about the scheduling section? Yes. No, I was I was touching my the volume of my mic because I think uh, uh, they said that it was quite low. Uh, yes, so so yes, thanks to the to the work of the operators who are really maintaining the system working. There is where where the astronomers start uh, becomes playing with uh, with the project, right? We have uh, just to give an idea of the magnitude of of uh, ALMA operations. Uh, every year we receive something of the order of one thousand two hundred proposals from observers. Uh, from astronomers all over the world asking for projects, individual projects, individual ideas, right? Uh, out of those, uh, something like 10% are, are accepted at high priority. So, but, uh, but in total, this accounts, every, and all these projects, each of these projects splits in a small uh, observing uh, programs, right? Let's say observing boxes, which are the things that we execute here. And typically, every cycle, we have like 3,000 of these boxes, and we have to decide at each moment what to do, okay? And then, so basically, depending on the on the weather conditions, the, the, the antenna availability, how many antennas we have working, right? Uh, yeah. Obviously, in, a, in such a big system, not all, the, not, all the, not all the antennas are working all the time, right? Mm -hmm. So depending on the conditions, the weather conditions, and what the project requires in terms of, uh, uh, in terms of weather conditions, sensitivity, uh, the antennas that are required. We have a we have a software which kind of uh, tell us more or less what to what to observe, right? Mm. So we are continu we are continuously changing from project to project every let's say every hour. Okay, yeah. Well, that's a, an important point that you made. Uh, the weather conditions. What would be the weather conditions optimal for making this observation? Well, the weather mm. the weather conditions have two two factors. One, one is the amount of water on top of us. There was something mentioned on the on the video, right? Uh, yeah. The reason why Alma is so high is because like something like ninety percent of the water vapor of the atmosphere is below ourselves, right? But but still, but still, there's still some water that uh, kind of bugs us for the observing. Uh, so depending depending on the project, when when projects require high frequency, going to the kind of the most challenging observations. We need really, really, really excellent conditions that uh, which are actually the reason why we are located at 5,000 meters, which is basically what we have now. 
this uh, we right now we have on top of us we have you know if 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 you collapse you condense all the water vapor on top of us mm -hmm. uh, not on top of Santiago on top of the <laughs> Charnador side yeah, yeah. yeah if you condense that water vapor it would be like one millimeter of water it's actually less than that now it's really 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 low uh, water content some of the projects are less sensitive okay some mm -hmm. of the projects uh, can be observed up to five six millimeters of water right but right now we have really really excellent uh, weather conditions perfect so for the public that are watching now and they are working from the control room in santiago as said by ludwig it's very far away from chak nantore actually where the antennas are and uh, if you have the possibility, it will be great that you show us around where you're working. And sure. show us where the station, what is the control room? Sure, why not? Um, contrary to popular belief, we have nothing to hide here. <laughs> Everything is public. So yeah. there's no problem in showing, up, in showing the system here. This is uh, a control console. This is mm -hmm. from where we... We execute the, all the panels that help us um, monitor the health of the system. Here we have, well, uh, these are panels that help us to provide support to engineering because we need to make sure that, for example, the, the antenna doesn't have to move when somebody is entering the antenna. This could kill someone. Yeah, it sounds harsh, but it's true. It's a 100 ton monster that can move at any time and really fast. So these panels here help us to ensure that the antenna is not moving when the technician is entering the antenna. Here we have another panel that uh, help us monitor some, um, the major subsystem of the antenna. Uh, as well, this uses a standard color scheme. Uh, of course, green means that everything is going on well. Yellow means that we have to put some attention at, some, at one of the subsystem of the antenna and red of course means there's something wrong and this could heavily affect the observation what are the cases that are something wrong with the antenna for example, for example a power supply that shut itself off for instance okay. and there are several systems that uh, shut off along with it mm -hmm. and and yes we can we can survive with some of those issues, but there are other issues that has to be that have to be fixed as soon as possible. Otherwise, the operation has to be interrupted. Okay, so that step would be that you will be calling some of the engineers, technicians, and they. Sometimes we well, we have our first. We have several workarounds for many problems, but mm -hmm. uh, there is a line where we can walk any further. In that case, we call uh, somebody from engineering and we have support 24 seven. We can call them at any time during the night. Um, well, it depends if they, for, for instance, we work with 40 something antennas, the minimum, the minimum antennas is 41. If we, if because of an issue with an antenna, we, we fall below the number, then we have to contact somebody to help us because we need to keep the minimum number of antennas working. And in, in the other hand, if we have plenty of antennas and we lose only one antenna that has to be removed from the array, from the observations, then we can continue working like that. And we just write a report and the technician will look into the problem the next day. Okay, so... What else can I show you? Well, here we keep track of all the activities uh, during the, well, it's not perfectly clear, it's too bright. We keep track of all the activities during the day, all the people that go into an antenna, all the observation executed and so on. We also have, well, this is a Linux environment. So here we have several consoles where we execute commands to perform some actions, to, to monitor, to control, uh, etc. Um, and this is the operations monitoring and control software. This is where we we see the status of the array of every observing array. Right now, there are no observation, as I mentioned before. But there mm -hmm. is some people in engineering that's working with antenna, just like it would be a normal array. 
so they're uh, executing some observations and scripts uh, and they're well they are optimizing the antenna actually and here we have other tools that in this case this is the correlator graphical user interface and this shows the correlation in real time of the antennas this also helps us to find a potential issue in one of the antennas of the array and here we also have a first look at how the, the data, well, this is really bright. It's difficult to keep the, the, the camera with the, with the right adjustment. Yeah. Uh, well, as I mentioned, there are no observations, so there is no data here in this panel. But usually we see graphs that also give us an, an idea if there is something wrong in one of the antennas. And in the top row, you see we have but we have this, this fancy desktop here with six screens, but we have more screens over there and they show more general information. For example, there is a live feed of the, of the AOS over there. This is in real time. We see uh, this is the actual situation of the antennas. This helps us to, to shut the system down whenever mm -hmm. there is a, a adverse a weather condition. For example, if it starts raining, we have to put all the antennas in a safe position. And that means lowering the dish. So there is no water accumulation in the dish that could mm -hmm. affect the, the receiver. And we point it to the east because usually uh, we protect the antenna from the wind and the wind comes from the west to the east. So we kind of put the, our back, the back of the antenna pointing to the direction of the wind. We also have a forecast. This also helps us to know whenever it might be possible to shut down observations. This is uh, very helpful for the astronomer to, to, cut, to kind of schedule the observation for the night or for the day. Remember, mm -hmm. ALMA works 24 hours. We can observe during the daytime. Unlike um, optical telescopes, we can continue observing for several days in a row. So this is basically, and, and the rest, well, there are desktops here. We have our lockers here. Mm -hmm. uh, there is some um, first aid kit over there, just in mm -hmm. case, because sometimes when we work during the night, we're alone with the astronomer. So if, <laughs> if something happens, if there is a health uh, uh, danger for one of us, then we have to act. We, yeah. we, we have, um, we received our first aid course a few days ago, just in case. And we have our air purifier, just in case, um, yeah. for the, because of the pandemics, just to keep the, the air clean. Because they, uh, we switch the, um, the operators yeah. coming here. So when, when there is a handover, when the next operator comes here, uh, we turn on the, the purifier so so there is a clean space for the next operator. So we are not affected by each other. And by the way, we have we are three operators on shift on duty right now. And one of them is at the OSF. Just because in case of an emergency, we need to have somebody at the AOS. If there is a power outage here or at the OSF, if, there is, if the link that connects us to the OSF is broken, then we need mm -hmm. somebody, somebody in the OSF to put the antennas in a safe position. So mm -hmm. uh, two operators here on Santiago and one operator in the north at the OSF. And no astronomers at the moment at the no, OSF, no? All the astronomers work here from Santiago. From Santiago, yeah. And um, what are the softwares that you use? I don't know if you mentioned that. Maybe for the people that are more interested in, in yeah. electronics and would like to know more about that, the systems. Well, there, there, there are lots of components working uh, together to make ALMA work. Um, mm -hmm. All the consoles are running on, on Red Hat. It's a Linux distribution, but the software running behind is uh, something developed for ALMA called ACS. Alma Common Software. Uh, you see, there is a lot of machines uh, in the antennas, in the correlator, in other buildings, so for archiving the data and so on. So 
when you have a distributed uh, computer uh, architecture and you have to keep to make all the system work coordinately so uh, we have this middleware uh, alma common software uh, which coordinates all these computers and it's based on a, on a common on our known middleware called corba that's mm -hmm. object uh, request broker architecture and this helps us to to simplify the how to say the development of different components uh, some for example our all the panels you just saw here most of the panels were developed by by yourself by the operators and this was uh, simplified by the fact that we don't have to worry too much about about the background running running in alma because we we know all the um, ah, what's the name the all the functions all okay. the functions to acquire data and to control the antennas and that's all written in the alma common software and that's beyond our scope so sorry <laughs> i cannot talk okay oh, it's very interesting and you show us in the stations also the science part for sergio yes i, I will show you i mean uh, already ludwig showed almost everything talking about software it's important to mention that uh, all most of the software is built in specifically for the for the for the alma observatory yeah. right mm -hmm. the software is very very specific and part of the software that ludwig was talking about it's basically the software what, that we use to control the antennas but we have software for people around the world to send their proposals, to, to deal with them, to track all these projects, and then to process the data, to, to, to follow all the, you know, to follow each individual project from the from the request all the way to the moment in which the data is delivered to the astronomer. And so there's a whole bunch of uh, software pieces that are involved in all this, so, uh, which is beyond just the pure operation of the observatory. So I will show you around here. Uh, well, you see that Ludwig is there. We are. Uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, as, as you, well, in, in the in the console of the astronomer, you will find almost anything but astronomy, right? So, so as as uh, as Ludwig showed you, all these top uh, screens up there have nothing to do with astronomy. Has had to do with the weather conditions. We are basically obsessed about the weather conditions, about the it's current important. conditions. And even here in the console, you will have this thing. This is. This is tracking exactly this. This is tracking the water vapor content, how the water vapor content is varying on the atmosphere, and also the variation of the atmosphere. On top of having this water, well, there's this kind of uh, turbulence that we need to monitor to see whether we can observe or not. And then, apart from that, apart from what already Ludwig has been uh, showing, right? What I can show you here is these kind of pieces of software that allow us to track every single project that we need to run, right? Here, you can see mm -hmm. the status, for example, it's not very clear to see here, but you can see that you know this observation failed, but then we have two successful observations. So this project is finished and delivered. We are happy about that. Here uh, we have a log. So everything that we do at the observatory has a log. So every everything that we run, any command that we execute needs to be logged uh, here so that we can track what happened during the night, right? And mostly the astronomer on top of of uh, of, uh, of scheduling the observation or running the observations. The main point is to is to immediately verify the quality of the data, right? We uh, thanks thanks to the coordination with the operator, we see that the, that the that the system is working, that the antennas are behaving. But then we have to have a quick look at the data to see whether the data that we just took is valid. So, and we have this kind of tools, right? All these things, uh, you know, green is good typically and red is bad, right? So here we have uh, a number of uh, of figures that allow us to determine whether the data that we just took is good or not. Like here, for example, we have the, the antenna distribution on the array, which antennas are uh, working, which antennas were not working for the data set. And, uh, and that's, basically, that's basically about it, what we did here. On top of that, when working from Santiago, uh, we also have a, a direct connection, although now it's uh, switched off, because we are will, in technical time. I will make the link. Yeah, so we have a direct connection with the control room up at the site. So that uh, we keep okay. the communication with uh, we uh, constant communication with the site. What it will be interesting Great. too is that you tell Great. us more Great. about Great. what are the steps of the observation. Like you monitor there, and then ah, there they are. 
Hola. <laughs> we have uh, Jorge up at the side. He's, uh, he's in the control yeah, room up in the, in the, in the USF. Yeah, great. He sees us. Uh, he... <laughs> yeah, it would be interesting if you tell us more about the steps of the observation. So you gather the data there, you monitor, and then what happens? So people can know all these steps. So it's a, it's a long journey. So, mm -hmm. so as I mentioned before, astronomers around the world propose their proposals. There is a committee uh, which decides uh, which proposals are accepted. And once they are accepted, we take control of them. We prepare the observations. Uh, we prepare the queue of observations to be uh, observed. And, uh, and then we execute it here. This is uh, what we do here at the, at the control room. After that, the journey is still long. These data sets need to be uh, processed. They need to be kind of combined. The quality needs to be assessed. So basically, Alma uh, makes sure that the quality of the data is good enough uh, for, for release to the, to the astronomers. And once all these, all these tests have been performed, then this data is sent to the, to the, to the astronomers who, who requested these observations. And then it's on the side of the astronomers to analyze it, uh, understand it, and, and publish. Perfect. I don't know if we have questions from our audience. They want to ask anything for Sergio and Ludwig. No. You, oh, it's in German. <laughs> you read German, Ludwig. Was that für ein Scheiß? Hey, hey, we should not allow those words here. Oh, that's a bad word. Yeah. Is it? Oh. I don't know if we have any more. Do they both have PhDs? They're asking. No, not me. <laughs> Just... yeah, it, it depends on it depends on the on the positions. If the, the astronomers uh by Let's say by definition they, they are all PhDs, but it's it's kind of part of the of the of the career. Mm -hmm. Well, well, maybe you could tell us what and what cycle you are now observing, and what is the configuration of the antennas. Well, right, right now we are finishing cycle seven, which was uh, truncated by the pandemic. This, this cycle, which typically lasts for a year, uh, finally lasted for two years because we were we had the array stop for almost 365 days, almost a complete year. We were we were stopped. It was only 10 hours more, and we would have been for a year. So basically, we are in the cycle seven of observations. Uh, so this is eight cycles already completed because we exa started on cycle zero. And um, in October 1st, that is on Friday, we are starting uh, the new cycle, cycle eight. So that, new, that means uh, new projects, new new software, even so uh, uh, a lot of uh, a lot of new things. In what kind of configuration the antennas are now? Yes. More a compact one or no? We are in, a, in the, almost the most extended configuration mm -hmm. we have uh, right now. Typically, in, in this image that Ludwig showed you before, uh, when we are in a compact configuration, you should be able to see almost every antenna in that image. But now you only see uh, you only see a bunch of them. There's uh, many of the other antennas which are in uh, which are spread over distances of uh, about ten kilometers. Perfect. So it's, it's pretty impressive. And you go to the side, you go in any direction, and you see antennas in the very very far distance. It's really neat to see. Yeah. What kind of observations you can do with that? Um, as, as I mentioned. No. As I, as I mentioned, uh, we are continuously changing, right? So, uh, so maybe now, well, not now, right? But typically, maybe we are observing something on the solar system. Uh, two hours later, we are observing galaxies at the origin of the universe. And uh, maybe four hours later, we are observing a nearby uh, site where the stars are forming, right? So it's really, really varied. But the reason, the reason why we spread the array, we put it in different configurations, is because each array, the, the most extended, is providing us the finest, the finest uh, resolution, right? It would be like the finest pixel size in, in an image, right? And then, but not all the projects need uh, such high resolution, and that's why we need to get back to compact 
uh, where we have a kind of a coarser resolution. Mm -hmm. Well, we have a question here from Lee Gordon. Wow, so many questions. I visit your site often. Is there a way to see projects in progress? Well, that's a good question. I don't know what, what I don't know what he means by my project is in, in progress, right? Right now, nothing is in progress. But uh, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, right, the, the, the closest thing to a project in project that we can show is this kind of thing, right? Where, where we can see the, the percentage of completion of a given project. But uh, but we do not keep. Uh, uh, we are not here in the control room. We are not keeping track of the images that are right, right? Uh, remember that once we collect the data, it requires a significant data processing. For, for kind of achieving an image. So the mm -hmm. fastest the fastest you can get the kind of a rough image uh, with kind of a very quick calibration might take uh, almost uh, one hour, two hours, right? So, so we only just uh, check the, the quality of the data as it comes, not the, not the images themselves. Perfect. Um, I don't know if there's anything that you would like to share about um, anecdotes that you had working in Alma or a specific discovery that was special for you. Any of that it would be great to hear. <laughs> <laughs> I think you have several stories. You've been here more time than I. <laughs> there's, uh, there's, there's so many stories that I cannot remember anyway. <laughs> but, but, um, Maybe the black hole, or oh, I don't know. As, as I mentioned, in, in many cases, when we are observing, we really do not know what we are observing. But sometimes we know, right? And sometimes, you know, for example, for, for the image of the black hole, this was kind of a campaign. We knew that we were doing this uh, for the first time ever. And that was, you know, you know, the, the people at the control room at that time, you know, they know that they are part of something really, really interesting going on, right? Yeah. Uh, a few years ago, when, this, uh, when there was this detection of a gravitational wave, right? You know, everybody in the observatory knew that there had been this kind of trigger. You know, it's like, okay, this optical observatory observed this kind of weird thing. We are going to observe it. Let's go for it. And then everybody knew that we were observing it. Then it resulted in a non-detection with Alma that uh, happens. Things sometimes are fainter than we expect. And, uh, but people have to understand also that even when you observe something and you don't, you do not detect it, that's a still useful information, right? It's, uh, it's not a failure, right? Sometimes you need to... Part of the part of the observations is to understand how bright things are, right? And some things are pretty faint, and uh, so it's it's a still a good thing. So maybe yeah, there are two things that they kind of can remind us. It was a recurrent question when we had the visitors there that it was about if there's any special event that's happening for observing. What do you do? Do you agree with? Um, the timing is special for observing, I don't know, for um, supernova, uh, I don't know exactly what could be, but how is that? If you can tell us a little bit. Well, that's a good question. I mean, as, as I mentioned, mm -hmm. there's many, many projects on the queue and they, they have a priority, right? So mm -hmm. if, uh, if, let's say something interesting or new comes, uh, there's kind of a quick door, which is what what's called the DDTs, this is director's discretionary time. And this means that any astronomer in the world would say, you know, I saw something really interesting on this data. This is super urgent. We need to get it done. And then yeah. this goes to the director. This gets approved. And then it goes top of the queue, right? It's like, you know, highest priority, right? But this is nothing that we decide ourselves. I mean, we cannot yeah. take this decision here in the control room. So that's, uh, that's, how, that's how it works. Then there's some other projects which are called target of opportunity, in which the, the astronomer says, you know, I'm expecting this thing to happen. Whenever it happens, I will trigger, right? And mm -hmm. uh, we get some of those. Yeah, well, actually, at some point, many of those. You have? So uh, there's a, a special one that you've um, experienced in, in that, uh, I don't know, in that form? Yeah, that's, that's for example, the last time? about the about the gravitational wave. Yeah, that was oh, one, yeah. Of these, uh, one of these examples in which uh, yeah. it was something super new, super secret at some point, you know, mm -hmm. because nobody knew exactly what that was. And, uh, you know, and then we, within a, within a day, we were already observing it. Mm -hmm. We have another question from Diego Nunez. What types of programming languages uses? 
well, the most widely used uh, language pro programming languages uh, across all are Python. Uh, right now, once we switch to cycle eight on in two days, we are switching from Python two to Python three. Also, we also use C plus plus and Java. These are okay. the most widely used languages here across all the panels you saw here. Almost most of the panels we operators use are written in Python, for example. And for the health of the antennas, what is that you monitor in in those panels? Is there the receivers too, uh, all that information of the antenna? Uh, there is, there, there's a lot of electronics mm -hmm. within every within each antenna. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are several monitor points, uh, several sensors uh, where the, the software acquires data. And yes, we, for example, take a look at the front end this is the receiver of the, uh, we take a look at the, at the analog power supply, the digital power supply, which helps to digitize the signal coming from the sky and, and sending it over to the, to the correlator. We monitor also the status of the correlator that all the machines working there are actually, actually working, are actually power on and and yeah, there is a lot of electronics. The ACU of each antenna, the ACU is the computer that moves the antenna because there's, um, well, it's split. The, the movement of the antenna from the, from the reception of the, of the electromagnetic waves from the sky. So the movement of the antenna is commanded by the ACU. We'll, we also monitor several, um, several aspects of the ACU the elevation axis, the azimuth axis, uh, the self-reflector, the shutter, which is uh, a door that closes whenever we we need to put the antenna in a safe position so nothing enters in the receiver, nothing can damage the receivers and so on. Yeah, but there there's a lot of electronics within each antenna. And you can control the movement of the antenna with a button, no? Just you press a button and they will move. Well, well it's possible. Point? It, it is possible to control the movement of the antenna manually, but during mm -hmm. an observation, it's yeah. it's done automatically. There is a script. It's called the the, schedule, the scheduling block. It's written by the by the project investigator investigator by the by the scientist, and it contains all the information about the positions and at what time the antenna has to point to a specific position. So wow. during an observation, we don't move the antenna. It okay. moves automatically. And that script is made uh, like weekly, monthly? Uh, How uh, do you... As Sergio mentioned earlier, uh, yeah. there is a tool that help us uh, help the, the investigator to create this script it's called the alma observing tool mm -hmm. and and well uh, it's it's a graphical interface that it makes easier for the investigator to to create a script yeah they they, they don't have to write yeah. too much code i think it's uh, yeah. Uh, yeah there are tools uh, made specifically to facilitate the process of creating a scheduling block mm -hmm. We have another question here that you mentioned about the front end. Can you tell us about front end systems? Wow. Yeah, well, <laughs> there, we talked there, about that in another to talk about the front but end. Maybe, if you can tell us in general terms, how many receivers may be there? Okay, right so end. right now, well, the front end is mounted inside the antenna cabin. And I don't know if you have seen any diagram of the antenna, but we have the dish. We have a self-reflector here. It's like um, in, in the focus of the dish, uh, it's like a mirror. And then the signal comes here, it bounces here in the dish and then goes down to the receiver mount in the center of the dish. Uh, currently it has eight, um, eight different receivers installed. Uh, they are divided by the frequencies which they can acquire. Uh, and right now we have from band three to band 10, which spans from around 90 gigahertz, a little less, to almost one terahertz, but it's a little less. Uh, mm -hmm. But right now we started the deployment of band one, of an, a new receiver. 
So by the later next year, we will have nine receivers installed. And band one is, um, will be a great addition because due to adverse weather conditions, there is no chance to observe even in the lowest frequencies. That means uh, band three projects are not available in some part of the time. So with band one deployed, we will be able to, to observe even more time. And well, it depends on them. Do you know when you could start using that band, actually? It's planned to be deployed by the start of cycle nine. That means October next year. Okay, perfect. So Diego Nunez is saying, thanks for the response. It's possible to access to the data that the antennas generate for the use normal people or amateur scientists? The the embargo you talk about the embargo <laughs> yeah, this, this refers to the to the clarification from lee a few months ago in which uh, when he was talking about uh, whether it was possible to see a, a, a project in progress uh actually actually not because uh, uh, the astronomers who propose the, the observations they have uh, one year of proprietary period and that means that you know the data are only sent to them and they mm -hmm. only them should be able to see it right even even these images that we quickly produce, maybe to assess the quality, we shouldn't we shouldn't show them around because you know uh, some of some of these observations might be more sensible, right? But this is a proprietary period of one year. After that year, uh, uh, this data becomes public, and there's uh, there's uh, everything everything that Alma has ever offered is in the Alma archive, and this is answering the question from Diego. So anybody can get into the archive, download the data. Uh, use this software okay. to generate the images and, and play with it. It's uh, absolutely open. And you need to register there and then you can access to the data or? Uh, that's a good question. Mm -hmm. I think I don't you might need to register almost, uh, almost for sure, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Yeah, Diego, so you can access to the data. Mm -hmm. That is after a one year released. If you need help, um, you can help on that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you can contact Sergio there. <laughs> um, Nico, I don't know if we have more questions for our audience, for public. Sergio Morgado. Sergio, can you get close to the mic? <laughs> well, he's the other operator that's from the OSF, no? I mean, he's too right? far away. That's why we can hear properly. Yeah, yeah, he's too far. <laughs> okay, guys. So thank you very much for joining us. Ah, we have another question. Yeah, what receiver temperatures? What receiver temperatures are there? Thank you so much for this session. So I think he's um, asking more about the temperature of the front end. The front end. Mm. Well, there are. The cryostat works at four degrees Kelvin, and there mm -hmm. are three stages uh, within each receiver: a four Kelvin stage, a fifteen Kelvin stage, and a one hundred and ten fifteen degrees Kelvin. So yeah, it's really, really cool. <laughs> really cold. It works on on liquid helium to keep that mm -hmm. temperature. Yeah. Yeah. And that's why the antennas are connected all the time now to keep this running. Yeah, when there is a power outage, it creates a really awful situation because the, the cryostat uh, shuts off and the antenna starts, the front end, the receiver starts warming up and it, mm -hmm. it takes sometimes one or two days to recover the four degrees Kelvin condition. The temperature, yeah. Well, I think that that would be the last question. So thank you so much for joining us today and giving all this knowledge about what you do, your duties and sharing with us. So thank you very much. And we'll see next month for another virtual tour, guys. Um, we will keep this information on our website so you can see what will be the date and the time for the next one. OK, so thank you, Ludwin. Thank you very much, Sergio. No You're awesome, both. It's been a pleasure. Yeah. <laughs> chao, chao. Que estén muy bien. Chao.